Like it or not, the enemy of your enemy is not always your friend. This is the tale that's part history and part legend about the bygone age of the Britons and the arrival of the Anglo-Saxons. Hi, my name is Sebastian, you're watching Mistakes That Change The World. At the beginning of the 5th century, the Roman administration of Britannia withdrew to defend Gaul and Italy from invading barbarian hordes. 410 AD was the year Emperor Honorius famously told Britain to look to its own defences. And that they did. The Romans left behind a defenceless territory with an uncertain future. Lacking a strong government and practically zero military presence, the former province of Britannia plunged into chaos, an age of darkness. Pictish bands dwelling north of Hadrian's Wall began plundering villages in the south, stealing provisions, killing numerous Britons and looting churches and homes. Without the support of the Roman legions, British leaders knew they couldn't stop the raids and attacks. Their only option was to hire Saxon mercenaries in the hope that they might quell the marauding bands. Not much is known about the events that took place, but according to tradition and the writings of Venerable Bede, this is the story. The year was 425 AD, give or take a few years. A king ruled in the lands of Britain named Constance. His closest advisor was Lord Vortigern. The king had spent most of his life in a monastery. He was a man of Christ, but that didn't help him in his rule. Constance knew little about state affairs, politics or administration. Therefore, it was Vortigern that practically ruled the kingdom. He might have been a trusted psychic at the beginning, but in the end he figured out that he might as well just be the king himself. So he cooked up a plan to usurp the throne from the pious king Constance. First thing he did was to gain control of the treasury. Then he extended his control over the cities and their garrisons. Then came the whispers in the king's ears. The Picts were planning an invasion, he said with the help of the Danes and the Norwegians. The best way to stop that invasion was, according to Vortigern, to fill the court with Picts working as spies against their own kind. The actual reason was of course a little different. He wanted Pictish nobles at the courts because he knew how easily they could be bought. Once they arrived, he showered them in favours, thus securing their loyalty. But life is not easy, not even at a royal court. Poor Vortigern started to complain about his meagre allowance he had from the king, and he told the Pictish nobles that he would soon leave, to seek his fortune and well-being elsewhere. Upon hearing this, the outraged Picts decided to take matters into their own hands. So they broke into the king's bedroom, caught him, and cut off his head. Grieving his king and friend, or so he acted, Vortigern ordered the execution of all those involved in this royal assassination. Now the Britons, they received the news quite well, however, the Picts from the north, they weren't so happy. They demanded revenge. And that wasn't Vortigern's only problem. Not only he faced the fact that he had made enemies of the Picts, but he also antagonized the two brothers of Constance, Aurelius Ambrosius and Uther Pendragon. Both had fled to Britannia but returned later. Now is the moment we introduce two new characters into our story, Hengist and Horsa, two Germanic chieftains who appeared on the coast of England in what seemed to be an attack. Following the two brothers, a band of heavily armed warriors landed in Kent. The Angles, Saxons and Jutes arrived in Britain. But instead of rallying his people to repel the invasion, Vortigern saw an opportunity. Vortigern invited the two Saxons to fight for him in exchange for money and land. It sounded like a great partnership. Together, the three achieved victory after victory against the Picts, and in return, Vortigern granted Hengist land in Lincolnshire. However, Hengist introduced a twist. He told Vortigern that in order to keep the enemy in check, he needed to bring in more people from Germany. Surprisingly, 
Vortigern gave him permission to proceed as he saw fit. And, as if this wasn't stupid enough, the new king also made Hengist a count and allowed him to build a fortified castle, Thonkaista. In hindsight, Vortigern's actions were reckless to say the least, but it gets worse. Now enters Rowena, the beautiful daughter of Hengist, and of course, Vortigern fell in love with her. So he asked for her hand in marriage. Hengist agreed, but he wanted something in return, the county of Kent. It all sounds like a normal medieval marriage negotiation, until we discover that all involved parties completely ignore the fact that the county already belonged to Count Gorongon, who also served Vortigern, by the way. Nevertheless, the king went forward and appointed his new father-in-law as the chief advisor. He gave Hengist's sons land between Hadrian's Wall and the southern part of Britannia as a buffer between the marauding bands and his own people. Meanwhile, the number of Saxons settling in Britannia was rapidly increasing, and those Saxons owed allegiance only to Hengist. Except for Vortigern, Every Briton could see that the Saxons were planning to seize power. When the British nobility expressed their concerns to vote again, he ignored them. However, the nobles were aware that if things continued, they would lose all their lands to the Saxons. So, they proclaimed Vortimer, the son of Vortigern, as king. Vortimer immediately began driving out the Saxons, achieving many victories. In one of these battles, Horsa, the other chieftain who came with Hengist, was killed. Many warriors had to flee back to Germany, some even abandoning their women and children. Those abandoned family members were taken as slaves. Soon, all Saxon warriors and their chieftains had crossed the channel back into German lands. When Rowena learned of all this, she decided to take revenge and poisoned Vortimer. Hengist received news of Vortimer's death and gathered an army to return to Britannia. Upon arrival, he sent a message to Vortigern, who was once again king. Hengist told him that he had brought the army to fight against Vortimer, thus pretending he knew nothing of his death. The two leaders arranged a meeting with their most important barons at Amesbury Abbey to negotiate terms. Tradition dictated that no one should come armed to a negotiation. The British nobles followed that tradition, the Saxons did not. Right from the get-go, Hengist and his men drew their daggers and slit the throats of the unarmed Britons. From here the story transforms into pure legend interwoven with the tales of the wizard Merlin. Vortigern didn't die in that massacre but was later killed by Ambrosius, the exiled son of Constance. We'll probably never know for sure which events were real and which were fiction added later to the tale. Still, there is some definite truth to the story, albeit a literary one. It conveys the sense of betrayal felt by the Britons in the face of the Anglo-Saxon invaders and offers archaeologists and historians a possible explanation for the sudden shift in power and the massive migration of Saxons. The story also carries a moral. Never make others fight your enemies. But if you still do, don't let them grow in numbers. The one with the larger army almost always becomes the king. That was all for today. I hope it was interesting enough to have inspired you to look into it further on your own. If you liked it, leave a like and subscribe. You can leave your comments downstairs and you can also check out my Patreon page if you want to support me. I do hope to see you next time, bye.